Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's Monday morning for me, so I'm speaking to you from the future. Um, but um, happy Super, Super Bowl Sunday to all of you. Um, and thank you so much to Courtney, who as amazingly as ever managed to catch the fact that it is Super Bowl Sunday, hence our change in time. So um, thank you for accommodating everyone for accommodating the change in time. Um, thank you again to the Dickens Project um, and the Friends of the Dickens Project for hosting this event um, and to John and Renee and to Courtney um, for all of the support they've given. Um, today I'm going to, obviously today is your chance to talk um, and I very much want this discussion to be led by your interests and the things that you found interesting about Harry Heathcote. Um, I'm going to kick off in a moment with a little bit of context for the book, just um, because I ran out of time last time and, and didn't get around to giving you that context. Um, but I wanted to get a sense before I began, please. Courtney has very kindly helped me to create a poll. Um, this is an anonymous poll, so I won't know who you are in responding to it. Um, but can you give me a sense, please, um, in response to this poll, which I'll send out to you now, of how you're going with the reading? Um, Initially, we said to everybody, you can read um, chapters one through six. And then at the end of last session, we said, well, you can probably read all of it. So I don't want to spoil it if you're still reading. But if most people have finished, um, then we, we can talk about the whole book. And perhaps we can just sort of flag if there's a spoiler. Uh, but as I said to John a few minutes ago, there really isn't a great mystery about the way the, the novella ends anyway. Um, so I'm sending the poll to you now. And you should be able to see it. Um, if you can let me know your responses, please. Okay, that's a 90% um, response rate. Thank you very much. And it seems like we're a mixed bag of, of people. So um, it seems that some of us are, are still thinking about reading it. Some of us have read all of it. And some of us have read chapters one through six. Um, and so what I would suggest then is that if you're going to, to discuss the second half of the book, um, please just mention that you that there is a spoiler so that people can mute <laughs> Um, when they when you're making your point. The examples I've chosen to discuss today are all from chapters one through six. So um, if you've done the assigned reading for today, it should be fine. And I myself will try very hard not to, uh, to break the spoiler rule and to leap forward. So thank you everyone who participated in that. And thank you so much to Courtney for putting that together. That's really helpful. Okay. Um. Okay, I'm now going to do a screen share. And as I said, I'll give you a little bit of context. Please remember that while I'm sharing a screen with you, I can't see your comments in the chat box. But as soon as I come out of the screen share, I'll, I'll attend to them if there are any. Um, in terms of the, the way I want to run this session, um, I think Renee's sessions provided a, a perfect model. And so I'm very much going to follow what she did. Um, I'm going to begin with an overview. I'll give you a provocation from Trollope's travelogue um, so that, you know, if you're still thinking about reading, you can still join in because um, 
very few people in this room will have read the, the provocation before anyway, I suspect. Um, and so we can spend some time thinking about Trollope's representation of the landscape and then broaden out to a discussion of the novella um, that will follow the direction that you would like to follow. Um, and also, of course, I have a little bit of an agenda of my own too. Um, so please, if you want to speak, the best way, because you, you're, you're spread over two screens for me, um, the best way um, to alert me to the fact that you want to speak is to use the raised hand signal, then your tile will jump to the top of my screen. Um, if you don't want to speak, um, then please put a comment in the chat box. Um, Renee is just a virtuoso at um, being able to type and talk and, and do all of those things at the same time. I'm not quite so quick, so I'll probably read your comment aloud. I might invite you to say a little more. And um, if you'd then like to turn on your microphone and join the discussion, that would be fantastic. If you'd prefer not to speak, I'm equally happy to just keep reading your comments. Um, but please don't be upset if I'm not typing back to you. It's just about my multitasking skills. Okay, so I'm now going to share some slides with you. Okay, so I thought one of the most helpful things um, to begin with is just a definition of the distinction between a squatter and a free selector, because that's really important to the plot and the tension between Harry and Giles Medlicott. Um, and certainly when I first started reading Australian novels, I really didn't have a clue what that meant. Um, so a squatter is someone like Harry, someone who's rented his land from the crown. Um, and that term began, as, as my slide says, as being slightly pejorative or derogatory. Um, it was usually applied to former convicts who were, who were squatting on the land. Um, but by the 1870s, it had become a respectable term. And the squatters were by this point considered to be the most refined of the settlers. Um, the term squatocracy began to um, to signal sort of quasi aristocratic class connotations. Um, and that's largely because those people were farming on quite a large scale. So there was a large amount of money involved. Um, and of course, for Harry Hathcote, there's also um, a class dimension as well that he brings to that term. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, you might notice that Medlicott says to Kate, the squatters here are what the lords and the country gentlemen are at home. So he's suggesting that somehow the, the, the British class system has transposed itself into um, Australia and and that the, the squatocracy is almost equivalent to the aristocracy. I think that's a little bit debatable. I think Trollope's being a little bit cavalier here, um, but I think that's partly the, with the way, it's to do with the way he's presenting Harry's character. So Medlicott is a free selector. Um, these are people who purchased land and you'll see that tension between Medlicott and Harry at the beginning of the novella because Medlicott has um, purchased land that Harry was previously leasing from the Crown. Um, and so this could cause real problems. Um, for instance, if um, you were to purchase a piece of land that obstructed the, the route to water so that um, you're, you're your, your cattle or your sheep couldn't get to the river anymore, that would be really a serious problem. Um, free selectors tended to be much smaller scale in their operations, um, and there was real sort of resentment between the two groups, and that's something that we see playing out in Trollope's novella. Okay, um, so this is, I think, the shortest of Trollope's novels. Uh, as I say, it's really a novella. It appeared in the Christmas number of the graphic in uh, December 1873, but it was also serialized in the Melbourne Age, um, and that began a month before, it began in November of 1873. And so you'll really see that in the, the format of the chapters, um, that they're very much um, written with a view to being serialized. Um, they're kind of episodic. Um, they show that need to, to hook readers. Um, and I think the episodic nature, the serialization might explain some of the, the more extreme melodrama, some of the very dramatic chapter endings because Trollope needed to make sure that those Australian readers were going to come back for more. 
this is just for fun, um, just to show you the, the reach of the work. Um, this is an advert for um, the serialization of Harry Heffcote in the Otago Witness, which is called I'm Speaking to You from Otago. So I, I liked the fact that there was a, a, a local connection. And that was very common that um, once something had been serialized in one colonial newspaper, it would appear kind of across Australia in different ones um, and, and often across the globe. Um, you know, there was a huge appetite for, for stories written um, by by people in England, just as in England there was a huge appetite for colonial stories by people in the empire. So Trollope had a really tricky relationship to the Christmas story. Um, in commercial terms, he was um, a very realistic writer. He never sought to disguise that he was writing for a paying public. Um, but he really seems to have struggled with the form of the Christmas story. Um, and, and he seems to have had a real dislike for it. So he says, nothing can be, this is from his autobiography, nothing can be more distasteful to me than to have to give a relish of Christmas to what I write. I feel the humbug implied by the nature of the order. A Christmas story in the proper sense should be ebullition of some mind anxious to instill others with the desire for Christmas religious thought or Christmas festivities, or better still with Christmas charity. Such was the case with Dickens when he wrote his first two Christmas stories. But since that, things written annually all of which have been fixed to Christmas like children's toys to a Christmas tree, have had no real savour of Christmas about them. And then he went on to say, and this is important for our purposes today, for the graphic in 1873, I wrote a little story about Australia. Christmas at the Antipodes is of course midsummer, and I was not loath to describe the troubles to which my own son had been subjected by the mingled accidents of heat and bad neighbours on his station in the bush. So I wrote Harry Heathcote of Gangoyle and was well through my labour on that occasion. I only wish I may have no worse success in that which now hangs over my head. Now, Trollope gives us a list of his earnings for publications at the end of his autobiography. Um, so we know that he made £450 for Harry Heathcote. Um, I've tried putting that figure into currency converters to try to work out exactly how much Trollope would have um, gleaned from that. Um, it seems as though in today's money that would be about £60,000, which seems like a lot to me, uh, but that I guess when one could live comfortably on £100 a year, um, that kind of puts it into context. Um, so for a short story, um, it was very successful. For the two volume travelogue Australia and New Zealand, he made £1,250 in total. Um, and so, you know, there are pretty large sums of money involved. Trollope did, in spite of his um, disdain for the genre, he did write another Antipodean Christmas story in 1878. Uh, this was called Catherine Carmichael, or Three Years Running. Um, this time it was set in New Zealand. It was published in the Masonic Christmas magazine. It's a really bleak little story. It does have a happy ending, but it's a really challenging text to read in lots of ways. Um, and I think Trollope is partly responding to um, a, a, an interest in the domestic British market in Australasian Christmas stories. They'd become very popular by this time. Um, and those of you who are familiar with some of Dickens's commissions for household words will remember that he has a lot of um, Australasian stories in household words and later all the year round, um, and a, a lot of stories about Christmas in the bush and things like that. Um, so there is definitely an appetite for articles about colonial Christmases. It seems to me though that Trollope was being a little bit playful with the genre as well um, by transposing it to the sweltering heat. Um, and Jude Peace, who has written a brilliant study of um, periodical fiction and emigration in the 19th century, um, suggests that there's a kind of inversion process going on, that you know, Trollope is, is not just sending his characters to the other side of the world, he's also kind of inverting the Christmas story genre um, by setting it in the heat um, and by making it all about a, a very dramatic plot involving a bushfire. There are quite a few other stories from the period that feature bushfires um, and because it's Christmas they usually feature rescues. There is one really horrible one from the end of the 19th century where everybody dies um, but for the most part um, they're, they're quite nice stories that involve uh, a fairly formulaic plot. Um, 
This story, of course, is also based on Trollope's experiences of Christmas in the bush. Um, you know, he himself spent the festive season on a sheep station. So there's a very personal, emotional connection here too. Um, and I think that really comes through in the way that Trollope represents Harry. We can talk some more about that soon, um, but there's a real affection, I think, that comes through the pages. Um, the critics were a little bit mixed in their responses. Um, the Times said uh, that the narrative moves with all Mr Trollope's accustomed ease and gaiety. Um, other critics were, were a little bit more lukewarm. Um, the Morning Post declared, Harry Heathcote of Gangoyle is not exactly a book to make one long to take up one's residence in Australia. Indeed, our conviction after reading is that it's that people it's people would as hard and lead as simple lives at home and make great men as a great many now who might, I'm sorry, a, at home, a great many who might now emigrate would refrain from doing so. But it sets before us a bush station and its ways much more clearly than many of the pretentious volumes which have been written with that intention. And the post also references the autocratic Harry Hethcote and his contempt for his sugar growing unwelcome neighbor. Um, but it then goes on to describe the Queenslanders as very well drawn and all the bush scenery and bush manners and customs admirably given. The examiner tells us Mr Trollope's hero, Hethcote of Gangoyle, unfortunately for himself, had a kind of alacrity in making enemies. A timid, scrupulous, contemplative man would necessarily be unequal to the exigencies of a squatter's situation, and Hethcote was the reverse of timid. He was robust, active, and something more. Mr Trollope describes him as an imperious and masterful man, resolved to see with his own eye and to have his own way. And then the British Quarterly Review says, as might be expected, Mr Trollope has turned his Australian experiences to account. Trollope was kind of notorious by this point for turning everything he did into some kind of publishing venture and has found fresh fields and pastures new for his novel writing genius. Although Harry Heathcote is a tale of the slightest texture and a very little incident, the canvas is small and the figures are slightly sketched in, but Mr Trollope gives us a fair specimen of his level, realistic writing and a tolerably vivid picture of bush life in Queensland. So slightly faint praise from the quarterly. Some of Trollope's Australian critics were even more withering. Um, he had offended many of them by some of, the, some of his observations about Australian life in his travelogue. And so people, critics took the opportunity to take revenge upon Trollope in their reviews of Harry Heathcote. The satirical periodical, um, the Melbourne Punch, was especially withering. Um, it produced a two-part parody. And if anybody would like to see this, um, I'm very happy to send you a PDF. So please just drop me a note um, and, and I'll send it along to you. Um, the parody is called Harry Hart's Horn or Hart Shawn, I'm not sure which, of Tinfoil. It is by Anthony Dollop. And it was published on the 20th of November and the 4th of December, 1874. So mimicking the, uh, the serial format in which the, 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 the story had appeared in Australia. Now Trollope had freely admitted that the character Harry was based on his son Fred's trials in New South Wales, um, but to try to give some distance to the story and especially to try to avoid allegations that um, some of the, the characters were Fred's neighbours, he decided to transpose everything to Queensland. And this relocation posed some problems um, because the landscape and the vegetation of coastal Queensland is really quite different from that of the central west of New South Wales. Um, and you can see from this map that um, there's a great deal of distance between the two places. Um, so in modern terms, it's about 750 miles. Um, for the Victorians, it probably would have been about a thousand miles in distance. Um, so, you know, a very, very different region. And remember that we're in the Southern hemisphere. So as we're moving North, the climate becomes hotter and much more humid. Um, and so that inevitably has an effect on what can be grown. Um, now Trollope takes advantage of that in some ways, um, for instance, in making Medlicott a sugar grower, um, but in other ways he just gets it wrong. And Punch 
really took issue with this um, and played around. So uh, this is a map of Mortray, which is um, where Fred's farm was. Um, this was found for me by a fantastic librarian at the National Library of Australia during our first lockdown when I was unable to travel and I was trying to figure out where exactly Mortray was. Um, so I'm very grateful to Andrew Sargent of the National Library for finding that for me. Um, so punch then, and sorry, here is an image, um, here is an image to give you a sense of just how different the vegeta vegetation is. So on one side, um, you can see a sugar plantation. This is a, a photograph that has been tinted. Um, this is by Richard Daintree. And this is a Queens Queensland sugar plantation. And then on the right side, you can see a painting of cleared landscape in New South Wales. And you can see the real differences here. Um, and again, we can talk a little bit more about clearance as we move through the novel. So Punch um, tried to take issue uh, with the fact that um, Trollope didn't understand his location and that he was being really cavalier with um, the whereabouts of the characters. And so uh, the parody Harry Hartshorn begins in the center of the wild Victorian bush situated on the Swan River, Queensland stood a form. Now that's important because it's moving from three different states. It's moving from the state of Victoria. Um, it's then moving to Perth, which is in Western Australia. And then it's moving to Queensland, um, just ridiculing Trollope for the way in which he's kind of zooming around Australia and moving things back and forth in this um, completely irresponsible way in terms of landscape. The form was dressed in a claw hammer coat, white hat with peacock's feather, no continuations and list slippers. At his back hung an enormous knife and through his hat a spear was run. This is the dress of the Australian squatter and this particular squatter was Harry Hartzell. After throwing his eye about for some considerable length of time, he gave utterance to a low whistle, but there was no response. To draw his huge knife and ram the blade in the ground, bend back the handle, seat himself on its extremity, and to be jerked into the topmost bough of the highest gum box iron tree was the work of an instant. And again, the gum box iron is an amalgam of different kinds of Australian trees. So you can see that um, Punch is just picking up on some of the more ludicrous things that, that Trollope is doing with his character. And if you read the whole parody, um, there's lots of um, laughing at Trollope's attempt to, to use Australian terminology and phrases, um, the fact that Jacko is constantly saying, oh my word, um, things like that are just um, grist for Punch's satirical mill. So the Harry we have here is a bit more like Crocodile Dundee than Trollope's character, but it really captures um, some of the excesses of Harry Heathcote, some of the things that um, Trollope gets wrong, in particular Harry's, uh, the attention to Harry's dress um, and that cavalier attitude to location and climate. And Trollope knows enough about the, the tropical Queensland climate to be comfortable in bringing in a sugar refinery and a plantation. He devotes an entire chapter to sugar um, and discussing the labor from the South Sea Islands in his travelogue. Um, but interesting, this is very typical of Trollope. Um, he sort of sets up this chapter on sugar and then he begins it by saying, the best sugar district is about Port Mackay, north of Rockhampton, which I did not visit. Um, it doesn't stop Trollope from having an opinion about it, but uh, he, he didn't go there. Um, but he was very interested in how figures like Giles Medlicott could set up farm on a small scale. Um, and having visited the West Indies, um, he was really interested in the, the possibilities for the small scale sugar grower um, and, and was exploring that through the, the novella too. So, I wanted to give you a, a prompt to begin discussion. I'll come out of the screen share in a second. Um, this is a quotation from Australia and New Zealand, Trollope's travelogue, which we spent some time discussing last time. Um, and he's talking here about Fred Trollope's farm, Mortray, um, which he uh, very discreetly identifies as M here. Um, and he says, the station I visited and which I will call M, was about 250 miles west of Sydney and was decidedly in the bush, 
I have already endeavoured to explain that nearly every place beyond the influences of the big towns is called bush, even though there should not be a tree to be seen around. But in reaching this place, I journeyed for three days after leaving the railway through continuous woodland, doing about 40 miles a day in a buggy. The house stood on a small creek, hardly to be called a rivulet, because the water does not continually run, and in dry weather lies only in a succession of water holes, and was surrounded by interminable forest. Close around it was the home paddock, railed in and containing about 50 acres. Such an enclosure about a gentleman's house in England is an appendage of great value and constitutes which some us uh, who are ambitious almost a little park. In the bush, it is little more thought of than as so much waste ground around the house. At Mortre, the home paddock was partially cleared of timber and was pretty enough. Outside it, meeting the creek, both before and behind was the horse paddock containing about 250 acres. So I'll just leave that there for a second so you can have a look at it. Um, and then we might move into a discussion just thinking about um, how the passage strikes you in terms of its representation of landscape and Trollope responding to the landscape and, and its difference. Um, think about how it might speak to, to readers back home in England. Um, and then we might move in to think about uh, the way that Trollope is representing Gangoyle and the landscape in the novella. All right, so I'll just come out of the share now. So anyone want to kick off um, anything at all that strikes you about the way Trollope's describing the landscape, either in the quotation we just looked at um, or in the novella itself? What's, what strikes you as, as interesting or different? Um, or if you know Australia, uh, what strikes you as wrong? <laughs> Grace, do you want me to put the passage back up sharing my screen so you can see people and they can Ooh, still see? That would be clever. Thank you, Renee. Um, what's the best way to share it with you? I took a screenshot of it so I can oh, just share. Perfect. It. Thank you. That would be amazing. Thank you. It'll just be a second. Ellen, sorry, you have a hand raised. I was looking at the wrong end of the screen. <laughs> and then Susan after Ellen. Yes, I've never been to Australia. <laughs> and I don't know if I'll ever get to go because it cost a great deal. But I did write a paper on it and I've read a lot about it. But that's by the by. Um, one of the things, two things. The thing that struck me about that passage you give us is it's um, only partially cleared. Um, that is, when we look at it, it's not this thoroughly fixed, polished thing that's all fixed up. Uh, it's obviously that that uh, it's there's a lot of work yet to be done, and it's still in the wild. So th uh, that's what I would say. That he's, it's not not uncommon for Trollop to introduce a novel with the landscape or situate us in, in a society. So uh, the other thing I wanted to say, which is not what you're asking, but it's just what I want to say is that what strikes me most about reading the book or rereading it um, is the is the portrait everybody says this is nothing original is the portrait of harry as trollope's son and i think to myself when i read it and i see things like all wrong details i'm told they're all wrong uh, uh, virginia wolf set to the lighthouse supposedly in the hebrides but yet it's all about cornwall because she didn't want people to see her family is so very close so I think that some of these these things that are, are uh, wrong are because he he doesn't want you to say aha Trollope's son, because he's criticizing his son. Uh, yes, he's absolutely. very much criticizing his son. His son is uh, while he, he sympathizes very much, his son is causing his own troubles. He shouldn't really be angry with Medlicott the way he is. He, his imperiousness is not well taken, and so we, uh, you can read it though. I don't know if his son. I don't. When I read about his son, his son was not introspective. I don't know if his son, I can't imagine he didn't pick up that his father was talking to him, giving him a kind of fair warning. 
um, that, that I, you said not to talk about the last six. I won't mention about what, but, but it's a kind of a fair warning. There's a, uh, a father to son talking to him. So that's uh, three comments. There you go. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, no, I completely agree. There is, um, um, he's got to, Trollope has to create some distance. Um, and he certainly, um, you know, there is a critique at work here of, um, if not Fred's own snobbery, then certainly some problems with um, just kind of transposing English values onto the Australian landscape um, and onto Australian neighbours. And, you know, one of the things I think we come away from Harry Heathcote with is that sense that this is, um, you know, Australia began life, um, it began its settler life as a convict colony. Um, and that brings its own set of, of class issues and problems. And so um, Harry slash Fred has to kind of moderate his expectations, moderate his behavior to other people as a way of, of dealing with that. Um, so there are definitely some, some interesting- Let me just interrupt a bit because you took me to mean snob. I didn't mean that. No, and that's my word. I'm sorry about that. He's, a minute, he's, a, he's very egoistic and he's seeing everything from his own point of view and what matters that's not the same as a snob you know it's 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 this egoism of refusing to look at the world from the other guy's point of view no matter what class he's in so that's what I was trying to say rather I wasn't meaning though there is a obvious hierarchy um I think snob snob is my word um <laughs> and I, I'm I think for me, one of the things that Harry struggles with when we meet him in those first six chapters is um, the way to place someone like Medlicott, um, who is, he's a manufacturer, um, so essentially he is a factory owner. <laughs> Um, and and when when he's discussed, when Medlicott is discussed by the other characters in those first six chapters, um, it's often in very qualified terms. So he is like a gentleman. He has the education of a gentleman, um, but he's never described as a gentleman. So he doesn't quite meet that expectation. And that's why I see a little bit of snobbery, a little bit of class bias there. Um, but we can keep talking about that. Uh, Susan, you've had your hand up for a really long time. I will come back to Ellen's comments about the wild. Um, I'm sorry, Ellen, but I, I've been keeping Susan waiting. So Susan, tell me what you would like to say, please. That That's not a problem at all. It's always uh, it was a great introduction and it's always a pleasure to listen to Ellen's comments, which are far more knowledgeable than mine. Um, like Ellen, I've never been to Australia, but what struck me throughout the book was the sense of heat that came through in the book. Um, and given that I was reading it in an English rather nippy winter, it was very welcome for that. <laughs> um, the other thing that strikes me, because I'm also simultaneously reading He Knew He Was Right for the Trollope Society Big Read, is that Harry would fit right in there. He knows he's <laughs> right too. Absolutely, that's great. Um, and no, the heat is just sweltering. Um, it's just so oppressive. And I think Trollope really captures that. Um, and he captures the discomfort. It's something that he writes about very vividly in, in a lot of his travel writing. Um, and uh, one of my graduate students has been writing most recently about travels time, Trollope's time in the West Indies um, and the way in which he decides he's, he's not going to wear his, his coat to go and meet the governor uh, because it's just too hot. And there are all sorts of anticipated problems about this um, because he seems to be compromising his class status by refusing to put the coat on. Um, in fact, the governor doesn't seem to care and it's all OK. But you can see that sort of playing out in some of the discussions about dress um, and the, the decisions that the characters make in Harry Heathcote about their clothing for good. Wayne. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted, thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, I, an 18th century person masquerading as a Victorian, this passage, the description of the station reminded me of Capability Brown. Oh, lovely. Who was a very popular landscaper in the 18th century. And typically people would have him tear out their formal gardens and hedges and replace it with something that looked natural, but really wasn't. So there are qualities of this place that might have been created by Capability Brown, but they're natural. And it just makes me think about 
especially I think the mid Victorians had a zest for rustic things. You think of the willow furniture and so far and so forth. So it, it's, it's, it, to me, it's a paradox that it's on one hand, very sophisticated and the other hand, very natural. That's all. That's really interesting. And it actually reminds me of a point that Ellen made in the last session um, when she was talking about, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Ellen, but almost the kind of act of will that it takes to create um, an English homestead, an English farm on the other side of the world, particularly when the landscape seems kind of wild and, and hostile to all of that. So I think it takes a massive amount of effort to kind of create that, that sense of a home away from home. Um, and I think Trollope captures that really nicely in this description and also in the description of the, the farmhouse um, at Gangoil as well. Thank you. Barbara. Yes, I've also not been to Australia, but I have lived in England. And actually, the time that I lived in Japan, this reminds me most of because there are areas in Tokyo where Americans have tried to recreate um, American housing without thinking about the not only the land, but the um, great amount of humidity that there is in Japan. So starting backwards here, we've got that in England, this would be have been an appendage of great value. And then when we go back up here, the appendage of great value, the creek doesn't run all the time. Uh, the weather's extremely hot. And then, you know, in the story, we learn that they're strangling the trees to get rid of them. Um, it, as Wayne said, it seems very paradoxical what's going on here. Yes, I can recreate something that um, maybe can't be recreated in this place. Absolutely. And I think you've really captured that tension between um, that attempt to um, to master the landscape um, and um, and the and and the the wildness of of Australian trees um, and just the the difficulty in in taming them in the ways that um, European landscapes can perhaps be tamed and I'm using the the word tamed in in scare quotes because uh, of course it's a completely artificial process. Um, John. Yes, one of the things that really struck me um, reading this for the for the first time was the scale of uh, 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 the enormity of the spatial surround. Um, and I jotted down a note that Harry was the master of 120 acres, almost an English county, and that he had five or six paddocks, each of 10,000 acres, and that there were 100 acres cleared around the house. I mean, those, the, the scale of that, particularly if you think of the comparison with England, which is explicit in, in that reference to an English county, I mean, this, this is a massive property. Um, and just that sense of, 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 of spatial scale and, and the contrast with implicit with, with England. And then at the center of this is a little attempt to recreate an English home with a garden, uh, a garden that is vulnerable to possums. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. No, and, I mean, it's- And it's mosquitoes, <laughs> mosquitoes. Oh, I'll stop there. No, uh, that's wonderful, John, thank you. It's, it's huge. Um, and I, I think, you know, for us today, it seems huge. And we're used to watching documentaries. Um, we see pictures and photographs of, of you know, places like sheep stations in Australia very regularly. So we're prepared for the, the vastness and yet still it's surprising. And so, you know, we can only imagine what it must have been like to Trollope. To, um, to go to Australia and to see all of this. Um, it must have been absolutely overwhelming. Um, and, and yet there is this sense in which um, you know, this tiny little house, this tiny little farmhouse is nestled within all of this. Um, and as you say, John, to kind of um, uh, 
ready prey for um, all of the things that might emerge from the bush, both, both animals, no, native animals, and, and also humans who might emerge from the bush too. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It's, it's enormous and, and almost kind of sublime in the way that Trollope describes it to us. It's just this huge, huge holding. Karen. Yes, I was just struck with how vividly Trollope describes the landscape for those of us who have never been there. And I wrote down one quote in particular, it was on page 48. It says, what does a man live for except to alter things? And that so goes along with every comment that has been made so far. I live in New Mexico and Easterners come here and plant gardens from the East. We have no water here. And so you see this repeated over and over and over, but it's this notion of dominion over nature. Yes. And that's the struggle that I just read throughout this book. I mean, men and women trying to conquer nature and that never works. It doesn't win, nature wins um, time and time again. But the way that Trollope progressed through the book with equating this with what was real and it, you know, is progress always good? Is it always bad? Does development always incorporate destruction? Uh, really big, big issues that I think are not addressed specifically, but you certainly feel the undercurrent of them. That's lovely. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that he is setting up these tensions and He's also kind of navigating his own emotional responses to them as well, because I think on the one hand, um, you know, he's amazed at the changes that people are able to make to landscapes. Um, and, and later in some of his journalism, um, he, he writes a series of letters in 1875 um, about his second visit to Australia. Um, and, you know, he suggests that somehow the, the European ability to farm Australasia, therefore, licenses their decision to take possession of the land and to displace the the traditional inhabitants of the land um, and that's not an unproblematic assertion for Trollope and he does spend some time sort of trying to add some nuance to the argument which I think probably just makes it all the more entangled um, but he is so interested in the the kind of tensions here he can't resolve them um, he's not enough of a radical to be able to do that I don't think but you know he's he's interested in staging them. He's interested in thinking about the um, the natural environment that need um, of people to to tame it, to alter it, um, to to make those changes. Um, but he's also interested in the environmental damage, and he doesn't always have the the benefit of hindsight that we have to be able to say, okay, all of these sheep are very bad for the landscape. Um, all of this land clearance um, is an ecological disaster which is just going to change the fire regime of the country he can't know any of that but he knows enough to be able to flag it as something for our attention and I think that's so interesting. Renee. Um, this is maybe related to Barbara's comment and also also maybe related to what Karen was just talking about but one of the things that was so striking to me in this um, in his travelogue passage is um, is the ways in which he he declares something, a certain word, you know, towns, you know, um, you know, this is called bush, and then he immediately negates it, even though there should not be a tree to be seen around, you know, the house stood on a small creek, hardly to be called a rivulet, like he keeps sort of declaring things, certain things, and then saying, but no, it's not that, like this word doesn't actually, this word does not mean what you think it means. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he kind of does that continually throughout this passage, even down to the end where he, you know, when he's talking about this appendage of great value, but in the bush, it's just waste ground. And so I wondered if, you know, it's interesting both that like the, the way in which the, the landscape seems to be described always through these negatives, but also that there's a defamiliarization familiarization of language specifically happen, like happening that these, you know, these words don't mean the same things in Australia that they would mean in England. You know, these terms don't contain ideas in the same way that that they would contain them in England. And so I wondered if there was maybe a way to to make a connection between um, between the idea that that sort of words aren't, you know, the the kind of English or, or England centric words that we use to describe things 
don't apply here in Australia. And even though we keep trying to, to mount those descriptions, we keep trying to describe them in the same ways, like the, the landscape itself and the, the dynamics between people um, simply can't be kind of linguistically or rhetorically um, contained in those ways or defined in those ways. And if there's a, the way, a way to kind of think about Think about language in that way in relation to you know to the you know to the kind of settler colonialism that's at hand and the ways in which nature is trying to be contained but but simply can't be like it's just not going to work language isn't going to work and these kinds of practices aren't going to work um that's fabulous thank you um yes absolutely um simon ryan wrote a brilliant book called the cartographic eye um where one of the things he does is he tries to unpack the way that settlers try to impose um ideas of the sublime idea european ideas of the beautiful onto the australian landscape and just how it falls short every single time or it downright misrepresents what they're seeing and and it's partly that sense of everything is so different that there's just not the vocabulary to be able to contend with it and we kind of see that a little bit in Dickens too I know I'm you know we're, we're all Dickensians here so um, when Dickens is looking at the Hudson River um, and um, it's just so big and and he doesn't like it because it's just big and, and he doesn't know what to do with it um, he just doesn't have the kind of aesthetic apparatus to be able to to contend with it and and so he kind of he's a bit dismissive of it and we see that quite often in relation to Australia too Marcus Clark um, who is probably best known for writing a novel called his natural life um, about convict life in Australia um, described the Australian landscape as weird melancholy um, and and I think that's kind of an attempt again to see it through European eyes um, Sue Martin and Kylie Mamuhamadi have done a fabulous study of, of people taking their Dickens novels to Australia um, as settlers and, and using those novels as a way to navigate new cities. Um, so again, you know, the big colonial cities were built on the money from gold rushes. They were huge um, and, and very imposing. Um, but people were trying to navigate them through Dickens's London in Bleak House um, just as a way of making them manageable. Um, because I guess, you know, there's a huge amount of, of shock and, and trauma for the migrant and people who've studied, uh, studied landscapes um, and their representation in the 19th century um, come to the conclusion that, um, you know, one of the problems is the way in which Australia was kind of marketed or sold to would-be migrants in England. Um, so Coral Lansbury in the 1970s wrote a book called Arcady in Australia where she talks about um, the, the problems created, for instance, um, by people like Richard Hengist Horn um, and other writers, um, Samuel Sidney, writing for Household Words about this green and, and pleasant Australia um, that really bears no resemblance to the parched reality that Trollope's describing here. Um, and so people would arrive in Australia thinking that they had farming skills um, and, and then very quickly realizing, as, as Harry does, that it's a completely different environment. Um, that it's not green and pleasant for very much of the year, it's big um, and, and we just can't handle it. So it's a very long response to, uh, to your question, um, but to the point you raised, Renee, but you know, it is a fascinating thing. And I think it's partly about a breakdown in vocabulary that none of the English words quite fits um, and they don't do justice to, to what the settlers are seeing. And perhaps they don't do justice to the horror that some of the settlers feel um, both because they're wondering what they've done in bringing themselves to this landscape that is so different, um, but also because it's just so imposing. Susan. Hi, again, just a very pick, quick point, picking up on what you were saying about um, clearance and not having the benefit of our hindsight. I mean, what struck me was how much foresight Trollope was showing on conservation and environmental concerns at what I, I think of anyway, at quite an early stage, but there is a lot about, and I'm not sure, I've, I've read it all, so I'm not sure where it comes in the book, but about um, clearing trees, the strangling of the bark, um, leaving a few for shade so that they're not taking up um, damp from the soil, and the 
consequences that has and also about indigenous habits on on clearance as well and all of that struck me as very prescient and um it, it wasn't a trollop novel that i knew of at all and i rather think that it, it should be emphasized because of the conservation issues and its topicality absolutely um it's it's so interesting to read him writing about ring barking. Um, he, he also does that in the travelogue. Um, and what strikes me is the way he describes the dying trees as a skeletal. Um, you know, it's as though they are human. And I think that's a very, very deliberate word. And I think in using that word, he's inviting us not only to think about the trees, but also about the other clearance, the clearance of the people who were there before the Europeans arrived. Um, and the skeletal figure is not just about the reality of the dying tree, and they do look skeletal. Um, it's, it's such a, a miserable, depressing sight to see a field of ringbark trees. Um, but at the same time, he's reminding us about the Indigenous Australians, um, because clearance will always involve, you know, not just clearing vegetation, it's also about clearing native animals and also about clearing people. So he knows all of those things and I think he's bringing it um, into the, the conversation. Um, and it's interesting that he chooses to make Boscobel, you know, one of the many villains in this novel, um, responsible for the, the act of ring barking the trees. I don't think that's accidental. Um, I think, you know, Harry is also managing the land um, and, and because he's a sheep farmer, um, he is complicit in this clearance, um, but we don't see him actually involved in ring barking himself. And I think that speaks to uh, a contemporary controversy about ring barking, um, which was an incredibly divisive issue. There were some settlers who thought that it was just a really efficient way of, of clearing the land. And then there were others who thought it was just appalling, um, which it is. I mean, it's a horrible way to kill a tree. Ellen. I wanted to just bring up the sake of bring it up. It's, we can go on to chapter six, two things. Uh, that there we see the convicts and the brown bees who are the bad guys, very bad guys. And it's a very negative picture of convicts. It really is. Um, in one case, he says that he has, um, I had it just a minute ago, Harry thinking about it, thinks that we should, he thinks the government should expert, extirpate them. Uh, um, and that's an, and that is, a, I don't know if they call it a class issue. It's, 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 it's another issue of, of people who have broken the law and the unwillingness to see them as human beings. Uh, and so that's an, that's part of the novel that, that uh, uh, where, he, where Trollope to my mind is not so admirable. Uh, his, his whole depiction of these people is, is um, unacceptable, untransformable. And I know I've read enough for Australian history that comics are very important in the building of a society. Um, a lot of them, when they got their ticket of leave, uh, were, uh, some went back, but some stayed. And so that's part of the novel. The other thing to respond to, to um, Susan, I'm looking a little ahead, just to mention one of my subtitles of the book is Men Against Fire. And the way in which there's, a, there's an understanding that fire is not just something in this novel, it's something you're supposed to be frightened of, but it's also something you can try to control and you can try to cope with. And that's a very different point of view from the way somebody who's English might look at fire from the point of view of England. Uh, and and I, I didn't read that, I didn't get up to that, but I, I remember that he's, he's very, I would agree, very prescient in his, the way in which he regards fire. Third comment, this is a bit, I don't mean to be nationalistic, I don't at all, but uh, sometimes I think that Australia was, uh, the United States was able to throw off some of these trying to look like England because we had this revolution. <laughs> And we fought them off and we told them to get out and we made our own uh, and we were and it was a much more diverse big place with many more kinds of people coming in. So that this business of trying to recreate some original society which the people the individuals did Germans did, but there were so many of them uh, and there had been the revolution. So there was more of a spirit of, of not recreating England but of inventing another country. Not that Australia didn't try to invent it, but of trying to invent a new country quite uh, explicitly rather than, so let's uh, just bring that in. Uh, it's a fascinating book from a colonial standpoint, even when Trollope is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, 
I'm going to try to engage with all three of your points because they're all really fascinating. Um, the convict plot is, is a really interesting one. And I want to go back to something you raised earlier, Ellen, which was about sort of speaking to Fred through this novel. And I do wonder if there is a little bit of that going on um, because I think, you know, it's interesting that Brownby has, you know, he's served his time 30 years before, but you're right, there is still this taint about him, um, as there was for convicts in Australian society. Um, and Noakes too, um, I, again, as, as Dickensian, some of you may have noticed that Noakes kind of drags his leg. Um, and we know from Magwitch in Great Expectations that usually when you drag your leg in a 19th century Australian novel, um, it's because you've worn irons, it's because you've been a convict. Um, so he doesn't make it explicit, but there is this sense in which, um, you know, the, the bush is filled with former convicts. Um, and you know, there, there would have been some truth to that. And so Harry has to learn how to live alongside these people. He has to learn that he can't apply the same values um, that he would in England to, um, to what he's seeing in front of him here in the bush. Um, and that perhaps he has to let go of some of his moral high ground um, and perhaps to even understand that the people can be rehabilitated. Now, I think the, Bram the Brambies clearly can't, um, <laughs> But there is this sort of broader suggestion that this is a convict society um, and convicts do have a role to play in that society. And, and Harry's got to relax a little bit. He is just a little bit too uptight about where people have come from um, and, and what might be in their past. Ellen, sorry, your hand's gone up again, I think. No, it hasn't. Okay, I'm going to keep responding to your points then. Um, the fire one, I think you said man against fire. Um, and, and that's a really um, interesting way of thinking about it. I think because um, one of the things that we are gradually learning about fire is that we, we need to find different ways of living alongside it rather than fighting it. Um, but Harry is completely consistent with the 19th century settler mentality in that he sees fire as a threat, which it absolutely would have been for him. He says repeatedly that you know it could bankrupt him um, and, and leave him with, with absolutely nothing. Um, there are perhaps suggestions that, that the fire is kind of, you know, that the fire is sort of, um, it's, it's a literal fire, but it's also emerging from Harry himself and his hot headedness as well. Um, and the way in which he um, is kind of making enemies of all of his neighbors. It's not quite like he's taking matches to his land, but he's not far off because he's pushing everybody into that. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's playing, Trollope's playing here again with um, a colonial arson plot, with the idea that arson can be a very potent form of revenge um, and, and thinking about the way in which settlers do have to reconfigure their relationship with fire. And, and one of the things I find really interesting about the, the Australian Christmas story is the way in which it kind of plays with ideas of fire. If we were reading an English Christmas story, odds on the characters would be sitting around a hearth um, kind of enjoying the warmth of a fire but in the, the Southern Hemisphere, fire is, is a threat. Um, it's something that will endanger the characters. And so they have that very, very different relationship. And that relationship began for migrants as soon as they got on board um, the ship to, to sail to Australia. Um, the only people allowed matches aboard a ship would have been the captain and the ship's cook. Um, and that was really important. So um, it's the beginning of a reconfigured relationship. John. On the, the point of fire, knowing in advance that this novel was going to deal with fire, I was very attentive to every mention of um, men who smoked. Um, yes. And uh, um, Harry carries a pipe and Medlicott smokes his pipe. And um, so th that, that topic, that theme is ever present, I think, in the book. And I like your mention of Harry's hot headedness as uh, <laughs> an indication of how his temper contributes to the, the fiery uh, plot of the, of the novel. But I wanted to ask a factual question and then uh, couple it with a, with a comment. And uh, the factual question is about Gangoyle. Is Gangoyle a real place? Where does that name come from? And then the 
the comment is about, it picks up on what Renee was saying and your response of, about the um, imposition of inadequate British language and terminology on the Australian landscape. And it has to do with, with names. And I was puzzled, surprised to learn that Bosca Bell is the name of an English rose. And uh, so uh, this is an invitation to, you know, look at many of the names in, in the novel. Um, and Noakes in particular was one, I, 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 I had noticed that his leg drags, but is, is Noakes an, a self-invented name? Uh, a, because Noakes is, as I understand it in England is, is the equivalent of the American name John Doe. It's a, it's a, a term that's used in legal uh, discourse to designate someone if you don't have his name. And so did Noakes assume the name Noakes as a way of concealing what his real name was and inventing himself again as someone uh, a self-invention. So. Um, I'm quite sure that you're right about Noakes, John. Um, and I think one of the reasons that makes me so certain in that response is um, Trollope's later uh, Australian novel, um, John Caldergate, um, where, um, which explores self-invention and the, the things that people get up to a long way away from home. Um, and so I think you're right. He's he's you know it clearly it's another signifier of his convict past. Um, there are definitely people you can meet people named Noakes in England, um, and it's spelt sometimes just with an O, sometimes with an O A. Um, so it does exist as a last name, but I think here it's definitely signifying um, some kind of convict identity. Um, so um, in terms of your thank you, I'm sorry I've. I've Patricia, thank you very much for that comment. Um, and um, I think also that um, in relation to your other point about um, that sort of, about Gangoil um, and place, um, so far as I know, Gangoil is not a real place. I think Trollope chose it because it sort of sounded vaguely Australian and, and he does that with some of the other place names as well. Um, so he obviously was kind of interested in, um, in the sort of sounds of Australian place names, um, which were often, um, sometimes they were adaptations of, of indigenous names and sometimes settlers misheard or misunderstood what indigenous <laughs> Australians were saying to them about a particular place. Um, so um, I think in that way, um, Trollope is trying to capture a sort of exoticism for his readers through naming his places. Um, and it's interesting that a lot of Fred Trollope's locale is, is in fact um, named, you know, it has a number of English or Scots sounding names. Um, so Trollope's made a very definite decision to, to adopt Australian sounding place names. Um, and it's interesting that I think we have Maryborough, uh, which doesn't sound at all Australian, suddenly appearing um, when they need a doctor for, for Medlicott. So I think that um, he's sort of capturing, he's catering for the exotic market. And we get that also in the way that he explains Australian terms. Um, he tries to sort of, there are little parentheses where he explains to a reader, you know, what a particular hat is um, or what a particular term means. And he's just sort of trying to be um, attentive to his Australian, to, to his English readers, trying to help them to understand the context and to get a taste for it, I think. Karen. Yeah, um, back to your comment. Um about Harry being over-invested sort of in where people are from and who they are, the class thing. What struck me in the first portion of this book is the complete self-defeating nature of such self-sufficiency and independence. You know, two traits that we so highly value, self-sufficiency, independence, and you just see the destructive nature of this in Harry, who is completely cut off from everyone and how that lack of support, that isolation just feeds into, he's so lonely. Um, there are passages that are just riveting to me that 
depict his real loneliness, just wanting somebody to talk to. And it's self-inflicted, but nonetheless, I think there's such psychological richness in that from Trollope in terms of all aspects of life. And uh, there's no cooperative, there's no interconnection. And I think that comes through very vividly. Um, it really does. There are some really beautiful passages um, where the narrator sort of talks us through just how isolated Harry feels. Um, and it's clear that, you know, his wife is obviously very important to him, as is his sister-in-law. But he needs he needs a, a male friend to talk to. He needs allies around him. And I just want to go back for a second to John's comment about Harry's hot headedness, because I also do wonder just sort of knowing what we know today about the heat, um, about the, the and this is total speculation, we can't sort of think about offstage Harry, um, but the way in which um, hot weather kind of inflames tempers. And so I do wonder if that's having an impact on 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 Harry's willingness to take offense. You know, he is so easy to offend, um, so unhappy um, with so many people around him. Um, and even when somebody who looks as though he might vaguely be a class match like Medlicott appears, you know, Harry doesn't like him either. So there really is that sense in which he is, um, you know, desperately, desperately isolated. And I think Trollope is really good at, at capturing not only his isolation, but also the isolation of the women in the bush too. Um, and, you know, for Kate in particular, uh, to be a young unmarried woman living on a sheep station in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, it must have been extraordinarily difficult. Um, and um, if you look at sort of pictures from colonial Australia um, at this time, you know, you'll often see these, these young women wearing the kind of dress, the kind of clothing that they would wear at home in England in the sweltering heat. So, you know, they would have been constrained in their movements. They would have been hot. They would have been isolated. It must have been just absolutely appalling for them. So I think this very much is a study in isolation um, and, and again, a lesson in the need to make connections within Australian life, um, to not be isolated, to not be remote and cut off. Good. Barbara. Just uh, going back to what Karen said about the self-destructive nature of all this. I mean, just the fact that he feel he has to go out at night and <clears throat> patrol the land. And this is too much land for one person to actually be in control of. It is, it, it's a stupid idea to think that he can know what's going on at, at every place on that piece of land. And and the logical thing with his neighbor would be to say, let's share this there, but that doesn't enter his uh, mind. He has set up this thing that does not work. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That does not work. <laughs> yes. Um, no, I mean, it's, you can see why Punch was so ready to parody Trollope when we just see, you know, Harry is kind of trotting off yet again on his horse to do another sweep of the boundaries of this vast sprawling property. And it's just not sustainable. Um, and so I think, um, you know, we're, we're moving towards, I don't want to, to spoil anything for anybody. So um, if you want to mute me now for a second, please do. But we're moving towards something that is about um, community and cooperation and the need to connect to others. Um, and I think that's so important um, for, you know, the, the ending of the, the novella um, and the, the message that I think Trollope is trying to, um, to, to give to his readers that, you know, this, this is not a sustainable way of living. Um, and Harry might have his provisions um, and, and everything laid out in his farmhouse neatly, but he's not going to be able to live like this forever. Um, he needs a community of people. He needs people who will help him. And he's vulnerable in the bush. Um, you know, there is that sense of vulnerability for, for any settler on a sheep station in the middle of nowhere. Good. Ellen. Uh, just to point out that people want to look at it, there's a very moving paragraph on chapter five, Busker Bill. The chapter, the feeling his wife should in any way take part against him added greatly to Heathcote's trouble. It talks about his terrible feeling of loneliness, how he has a brave front, uh, how he knows he's weak, uh, how he's painfully conscious of it. Um, 
He has no one with whom he could converse freely and so on. I think that's a common theme in Trollope. Uh, Susan mentioned he knew he was right with Paul Trevelyan, who everybody by the, by the time of the middle of tells him he's wrong, <laughs> except Basel, the one person he should not be listening to in a way. But think of Josiah Crawley. Uh, he has a lot of these isolated people who withdraw and we watch them in great pain. I think it's Trollope also himself showing us some of his own inner life which he, he hides from us and he successfully overcame later in life. But uh, it's, a, it's a very big theme for him, this business of the person. And he has women like that too. Mary Lady Mason, I think of, who has to all her life play this rigid part in order to fool everybody and not let anybody. So I think that's a kind of a uh, important theme across Trump. That's a really nice comment. And I think, um, you know, considering how short this work is, one of the things that I find really striking every time I read it is just um, the depth of uh, Trollope's engagement with Harry's psychology um, and that understanding of the, um, the sort of the misery and depression that can come from from living too much in one's head. Um, so yes, absolutely, Trollope really gets that um, and conveys it to the reader in in really vivid terms. Um, I'm just thumbing through my book trying to find a passage um, that we can look at to, to have a sense of, um, of how Trollope conveys that to us as readers. Um, maybe if we look at chapter five, um, it's page 35 for me, um, and it's, it's actually in the same chapter, it's in the Boscobel chapter, um, which reminds me that I did not engage with John's comment about Boscobel as, as being a rose, um, but we should pick that up again. Um, so this is where he's just had a bit of an argument, um, or it, not exactly an argument, but he's had a disagreement with his wife, Kate, about the Nedlicotts and becoming friends with the Nedlicotts. Um, and he's feeling a little bit um, disgruntled and isolated because of that. And um, then the narrative picks up the feeling that his wife should in any way take part against him added greatly to Hethcote's trouble. It produced in his mind a terrible feeling of loneliness in his sorrow. He bore a brave outside to all his men and to any stranger whom in these days he met about the run, to his wife and sister also, and to the old woman at home. He forced upon them all an idea that he was not only autocratic, but self-sufficient also, that he wanted neither help nor sympathy. He never cried out in his pain, being heartily ashamed even of the appeal which he made to Medlicott. He spoke aloud and laughed with the men and never acknowledged that his trials were almost too much for him but he was painfully conscious of his own weakness. He sometimes felt when alone in the bush that he would fain get off his horse and lie upon the ground and weep till he slept. It was not that he trusted no one. He suspected no one with a positive suspicion except Noakes and Medlicott as the supporter of Noakes, but he had no one with whom he could converse freely, none whom he had not been accustomed to treat as the mere ministers of his will, except his wife and his wife's sister. And now he was disjoined from them by their sympathy with Medlicott. He had chosen to manage everything himself without contradiction and almost without counsel. But like other such imperious masters, he now found that when trouble came, the privilege of dictatorship brought with it an almost insupportable burden. So just an absolutely heartrending passage. Um, that shows just how disconnected he is um, and the difficulty of, of positioning himself um, as the master and, and not being able to connect with his, uh, the people who work for him um, because of the way that he's, he's kind of continuing to uphold um, the, the value system he's brought with him from home, um, that he can't get too close to the people who work from him, to, to the people who work for him. Um, and so I think, um, you know, there's a big discussion about mateship in Australia um, and, and a kind of effacement of, of class boundaries. And I think that Trollope is, is gesturing towards this here, that, that, you know, Harry needs to put aside some of these, these prejudices, um, some of his expectations surrounding class, um, and he just needs a friend. 
So there's a lot of discussion in the chat at the moment. Someone said, is this a morality novella um, in Trollope speak? Um, in some ways, I think it is. It's definitely a novella in which we're, we're learning, from which we're learning something. Um, Susan then says, are we perhaps particularly alive to the feeling of loneliness and isolation when living in one's head after the lockdowns of the pandemic? That's a really lovely observation. I think that's probably right. We, we get it perhaps in a way that we didn't before. Um, and you know you can be isolated in your own home um, and and in your own head. Um, so it's a really nice way of, of thinking about that um, and perhaps drawing a connection between um, us and and Trollope's characters, particularly poor Harry. I think what's also interesting is the way that um, Harry is um, because he's living so much in his own psyche. Um, he's also so excessively concerned about fire. Um, you know, his his concern about fire is is not normal. Um, I've read enough bush narratives to know that Harry is probably one of the most concerned characters I've come across when it comes to a bushfire. Usually a character will sort of say, oh, it's a hot day. <laughs> there are flames in the distance. Perhaps there will be a fire. Um, but Harry is just constantly thinking about fire. If he's not thinking about how isolated he is, then he's thinking about the possibility that he's going to be ruined through fire. And the critic Robert Dingley makes a really nice observation, which is that as soon as it begins to rain, Harry thinks there's going to be a flood. So he has this kind of catastrophic anxiety um, and perhaps he's projecting that anxiety onto his environment. Um, that, you know, it's the things that he can't control and the unruliness of the environment is just compounding that sense of, of isolation, of depression. And Trollope doesn't use the word depression, I don't think, but I think that's what we're seeing. Um, and, and I register at the same time that it's not helpful for me to be diagnosing characters in 19th century novellas. Ellen. Well, I'm being autobiographical, but I think it's there. Here's this father feeling for his son. There is the father feeling for his son who probably he couldn't say, and, and I wonder, uh, we all know that uh, that Fred actually, I call it, failed, and they didn't manage to make it, and he finally made it by getting a job in the government, and then he did okay. So maybe it's, it's the, this, he's afraid of fire, he's afraid of flood, that is in his heart or somewhere in him, he's afraid he's going to fail. He had failed in school, everybody else, he'd gotten too tall, he wasn't doing well in school, he'd come out there, and he wants to, in a way, he wants to come up to his father. He, he, he wants to uh, he wants to succeed. And there's this tre tremendous fear in the actual real person maybe being mirrored in this uh, character of uh, and this and this uh, and this uh, prophetic feel, oh my prophetic soul, I'm gonna fail, it's not gonna work, I'm gonna and then what'll happen? And he didn't want that to happen. Charles yeah, spent I mean, a lot of money, didn't he? He put a lot of money into this, I think. Yes, he did. He absolutely did. And um, when Fred did fail, he had to travel to Australia again and, and settle up Fred's debts. And then they sold the farm at a massive loss. Um, so, yes, it was um, financially, it was a, a very, very difficult time for, for both Fred and for Anthony Trollope. Um, thinking a little bit about Harry, I think, um, you know, on the one hand, Harry is difficult to get right because he has this aura of, of achievement and success um, and poise. And then we see beneath that, um, you know, he's just so anxious. And I think that's an anxiety that must have lived with many, many settlers um, because, you know, the stakes are so high. If you fail at home, that's very difficult. But if you fail far from home, that's even worse. Um, and so, you know, Fred Trollope has his father to bail him out. Um, Harry Hecker is an orphan. So he's already got his inheritance. He has staked his entire inheritance in this venture, in the colonies. And if it fails, he has a wife, he's got children, um, and there is nobody who is going to catch him if he falls. So um, Trollope's really exploring those consequences of, um, of becoming a migrant, the risk involved in being a farmer. And of course, Trollope's own father had been a failed farmer, among other things. Um, so he absolutely understands that, um, that failing, uh, that, that farming um, is fraught with risk in any context, but additionally so in Australia. I guess I wanted to add one more thing to what I said before about floods and fires, which is that, of course, you know, we are living in a time, um, as we all know, where we're sort of moving from disaster to disaster to disaster. So there's something quite prescient about the way that, that Trollope depicts that. 
Um, Wendy, thank you. Yes, there is an interesting parallel between Fred and Dickens' son, Plorn. Um, Plorn, of course, also lived in New South Wales. And Mary Lazarus um, wrote a fantastic book called A Tale of Two Brothers. And um, one of the, the many things that she does in this book is to describe um, Fred and Plorn meeting in, um, a, in a courtroom. So there was a trial about um, cruelty to a horse and Fred Frollop was the magistrate. Um, and Plorn was a witness. Um, and so they did know each other. Um, poor Plorn did not prosper in Australia. Um, and in fact, um, if you go to Moree in New South Wales, um, you can see Plorn's gravestone, uh, which was erected by the Trollope Society of New South Wales, I think in the 1950s, um, because Plorn died with so little that the, the family could not afford to put up a stone in his memory. And there's real pathos to that stone because actually most of the, the narrative is about Charles Dickens and the fact that Plorn is, is Dickens' son. Um, it says very little about his own life, so a kind of colonial tragedy if ever there was one. Um, and yes, um, Tom Keneally's book, The Dickens Boy, is fantastic. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I definitely recommend it if anybody wants to see a sort of creative reworking of um, the, the Dickensian Australasian connection. Uh, great, Wendy, to see that Maury is on your list. Um, it's quite a small town. Um, there's not much to do there other than to look at um, the, the, the tombstone, um, but the Blue Mountains um, are, are breathtakingly beautiful. Um, and I can see that you're actually there already. So you must know that. Um, so yeah, I think um, we're dealing with a very um, psychologically complex character. And I think it's a real testament to Trollope's great skill that he can compress all of this into you know, what is essentially 100 pages. Um, it's a really extraordinary work in the attention that it pays to, um, to Harry's inner life. Um, to the pressures that come with being a farmer in the in the bush um, and to the many different things that he has to juggle, the many responsibilities that he has to juggle and the sheer physical exhaustion. That's the other thing that Trollope captures really well. I mean, it is ludicrous to think about Harry riding around all over the place and then saying, no, no, let me go for the doctor um, because he hasn't ridden enough already. Um, but I think that um, you know, Trollope is, is very aware of just how hard um, a farmer in the bush has to work to be able to, to just keep going. Um, and so those scenes where um, Harry finally allows himself to go to sleep um, are just so, so telling um, as to the sheer exhaustion that came with bush life. Good. I think there's a nice parallel that we can draw out if we want to, um, and some of you might think that I'm pushing this too far and I'm happy for you to tell me that. Um, but I think there's a nice parallel with some of the boundaries um, that um, that Trollope is playing with in this novel. It's a, it's a, it's a work about boundaries. You know, it's a work about fences um, and enclosing land and trying to protect land. Um, and patrolling land and watching to see who's on your land um, or who is kind of looking at your land. Um, but it's also about sort of mental boundaries as well. Um, and, and I wonder if we can do something with that, if we can play a little bit with the, um, the boundaries between the, the physical, the geographical location um, in which we see Harry placed um, and some of the boundaries that we see um, perhaps being challenged in, in, in Harry's own mind. So Patricia says boundaries in all senses. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and perhaps we might think about, you know, the, the kind of rigidness of the boundaries that are uh, the class boundaries that Harry sets up when we first meet him um, and the, the way in which he, he's definitely kind of pigeonholing people according to where he thinks they've come from and, and who he thinks they are um, and bringing that class baggage. So that's a boundary, definitely. Um, and it's possibly a boundary to um, his success in the bush too. Ernie. Well, I, I don't know if, am I off mute? You are off yeah. mute. I, I don't know if this is strictly about boundaries, but and I don't know a lot about Trollope, uh, like all you people, but I, I have I read The Warden and then I read this and I just found it so interesting the way um, talking about boundaries of who's right and who's wrong about things, how 
it comes up. And I was just thinking about the thing about uh, Noakes being fired in England, how Medicott, it would be very reasonable to just give him another chance and someone else hiring him, although we do have non-compete clauses. But um, he, uh, in, if you're out in the place where you're way out in a wild, area with nobody else around and so forth if that person sticks around he's real danger and so maybe harry is really pretty right that uh, medicott was pretty wrong in uh, in hiring him and not sticking together with with uh, the fellow uh, settlers that's a missing. lovely point um no that's super and i think you're you're spot on that um you know if, if you fire somebody in the bush and you are as isolated as the farm at gangoyle is then it's fraught with risk um because you, know, you have this vengeful person um and and you know setting fire to something is is a tried and true way of taking revenge especially in this context um you know you could there's, there's the potential that Noakes or the Brown Bees or Sing Sing or anybody can just kind of, you know, they can bankrupt Harry overnight and, and what better or kill his family too. And I think that's why, you know, it's why it's a capital offence. Um, it's why it was taken so seriously um, by the, the Australian legal system. Um, um, and so, yeah, I think there's there's a, a pervasive danger, not just in this novel, but um, more broadly in Australian fiction of the period about the person who's been wronged um, or the person you don't know. You know, somebody, it's, it's not just people you've wronged who might be lurking in the bush waiting to do you harm. There's also that sense in which um, there are people in the bush emerging from the bush um, whom you might not know, strangers, and, and they could be equally dangerous. And I think that points what, what you're, you're gesturing towards is um, a more deep rooted concern um, about you know, the, the big group of people who have been wronged, who might take revenge, that sort of settler anxiety that is often not fully articulated about um, Indigenous Australians possibly taking revenge for, for what has been done. And I think I might have said this in the last session, but you'll often read um, fire narratives from this period where you'll see characters, Indigenous Australian characters with matches um, or, or fire sticks or something, um, just kind of making, um, about to take revenge. Often this is a misunderstanding of, of how Indigenous people interact with fire and often settlers would mistake controlled burning for acts of arson. Um, and so, you know, there's, it's, it's an interesting sort of um, dilemma that is being staged in the novel, often not fully articulating that problem. John. This, this goes in a slightly different direction from much of what has been said, but I maybe, I, I, I think it does connect back. Um, I was struck by what an international book this is. Um, German, Irish, Polynesian, um, and uh, as well as, as English. And uh, then there are those indeterminate characters. I mean, Boscovel is, is one and Jacko. Uh, and, and so it takes me back to the, the question of identity and um, constructed or imposed identity and uh, and ultimately to questions of, of race and racial origin and national origin and the ways in which those are in the background of, of this book. I mean, Sing Sing the Cook, uh, yes. for example. So uh, do you want to explore questions of, of race and race and national identity and how they're being um, interrogated in this novel. Absolutely. Um, I think that's that's such an important point. Um, I'm just going to very quickly do a screen share. John, you mentioned Jacko, and um, I've always suspected that Jacko was supposed to be an Indigenous Australian. There are sort of some clues in the text that suggest that way, but Trollope is a little bit coy on coming out and declaring that. But here's an illustration from the graphic, um, which I will just put up very briefly. Um, and you can see this is um, Harry um, in his full bush garb, uh, sort of approaching Jacko and saying, you young monkey, have you been using matches? 
Um, and um, you can see there's no question in this image, um, this is from the original graphic, there's no question that Jacko is an Indigenous Australian here. Um, and so it's interesting um, and important, I think, that um, Trollope is, is showing us this, this you know, helpful, um, not quite companionate, but, but friendly um, Indigenous character. And I think this reflects something that Helen Lucy Blythe has described about the way Trollope used his novels to revisit questions of race after he had traveled in Australia. Um, so something we talked about a little bit last time was the way that Trollope would just write about his experiences and, and publish as he went um, and then um, not revise very much before publishing all of his um, travel writings as, as a travelogue. And this meant that a lot of the things that he said about race were inconsistent. And I think he felt some regret about some of the things that he said um, in his early travels in Australia about Indigenous Australians. And so Blythe's argument is that Trollope uses his fiction to try to revisit those issues and to try to, um, to set things right. And so by creating this helpful character, Jacko, who is a friend to Harry, although of course they can never be friends because Harry is his master um, and Harry is a European and Jacko is an indigenous Australian. So the parameters of the novel won't allow for a friendship. Um, the parameters of the sort of class and racial boundaries here won't allow that to happen. Um, but he's reworking all of this um, and showing, um, showing his readers that perhaps he might have gotten it wrong. Um, John, you mentioned the, the Polynesian sugar workers. I'm so glad you did. Um, they are incredibly important. Um, Trollope has an entire chapter on sugar in his travelogue. Um, and one of the things that he writes about is um, the conditions of the Polynesian sugar workers. Now, um, these people were often victims of what the, of what the Australians called blackbirding. Um, some of them were coerced into traveling to Australia. Many of them were kidnapped um, and they worked in conditions that were very closely akin to, to slavery. Um, and it's something that um, Australia is continuing to explore today um, and to, to think about in terms of you know, historical injustices and apologies that need to be made. Um, and Trollope is, He's characteristically ambivalent on the, um, the conditions of, of the Polynesian sugar workers. Um, on the one hand, um, he's kind of aghast at the idea that um, there might be a new form of enslavement being set up. On the other hand, some of his friends own sugar plantations, and so he's a little bit defensive too. And so the chapter makes for very awkward reading. It is that sort of strange ambivalence that we can often find in Trollope, where he's trying to be even handed, but what comes across is a little bit inconclusive and a little bit defensive. Um, but, you know, they're definitely, I think we can assume that these, these characters um, who really only get a, a fleeting reference in the text um, are not willingly in the, 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 gang, the, the landscape of, of Queensland or, or New South Wales or wherever they really are, um, that they've been brought here, um, if not against their will, then coercively. Um, and so there's just a little trace of them in the text as, as a signal of, of something that the Trollope as a realist writer was going on around him, um, but that needs a little more historical excavation to pull it out. Um, and likewise with Sing Sing, Sing Sing the Chinese cook, um, who is sort of set up, I don't want to ruin things for people who haven't yet read ahead, but he's set up as being a more significant character than perhaps he turns out to be. Um, Sing Sing's presence is an interesting one because he represents quite a large population of, of Chinese workers um, who arrived in Australia um, in the 1850s for the gold rush. Um, and some of them had spent time in California already and some of them later actually came to New Zealand um, and, and worked in Otago. Um, and there was a huge amount of prejudice against the Chinese. Um, and I think we see that in the, the traces of Sing Sing and the way that Trollope treats him in the narrative. Um, but again, he's a character who is not fully realized. And I think that's because Trollope just doesn't really know what to do with him. 
Um, but he, again, he's another of these characters who has the potential to be vengeful. Um, and it's interesting that Trollope is kind of aligning vengeance here, possibly with race. Um, it's something, it is, as, as John says, it's a very, very international novel. And Trollope is sort of drawing interesting boundaries as to who is kind of which 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 races are trustworthy we have a we have Bender Carl Bender the uh, the hard-working German character uh, we also have Mickey the Irishman and of course Trollope had spent time in Ireland and, and was quite fond of the Irish um, and so we see all of these things playing out um, but I love the idea of this being an international novel I hadn't thought of it in those terms before but there is this fascinating cast of characters from all over the place Susan, I'm sorry, before I started talking, you made a really interesting comment in the chat um, where you say, you ask, um, is the double nature of fire threat controllable too, also tied in, tied in with boundaries? It both destroys some of Harry's fencing and creates fire breaks, which will stop the wildfire destroying more fencing and land. That's really nice. And I wonder if we can push it a little bit further that once the fire has happened, in a way, Harry doesn't have to fear it as much as he did. Um, you know, he's dealt with it and he now knows that he can. And so maybe it also breaks down a mental boundary at the same time too. Um, I think that's, that's a really interesting idea. Thank you. Ellen. Just gonna push back a little bit. Uh, on, it's partly boundaries that men, mm. the world can't revolve around, around Harry. And if he takes revenge on people, everybody can't just do uh, worry about who, who's gonna hurt him. And I think I thought Medlicott in the chapter in which he tries to reason with him was very right. I, I, I have reason to suspect the man, but I don't know for sure today is his day off. And one of the ways in which, which uh, Harry uh, finally gets beyond boundaries is his acceptance of Medlicott. Uh, and not his way of thinking, because Harry doesn't seem to be able to do that kind of thinking. And the other thing is just to mention three instances, two of them very unpleasant, but I'll mention them in one a little better. The unpleasant one is at one point in Australia and New Zealand, he talks about the gradual extermination of, of uh, Aborigines. And another place, I don't remember where I read this, but he defends the uh, contract servitude. He does defend it. And yeah. you know, so we have to, he does do some of the things. I, and I don't remember the details anymore, but there's a Maori in Catherine Carmichael. Who yes, that's right. She's married to this very brutal man. And he becomes a kind of friend of hers. And he's yeah. really called a Maori. We don't have to just say monkey. There's no, this, the, and, and I know that in, in, in the New Zealand part, Charles goes swimming with Maoris and he yes. really admires them. Actually, one of the reasons he thinks England shouldn't go to war with Maoris is he thinks they'll lose. <laughs> he thinks the Maoris yeah. are, are gonna beat them. So uh, uh, you also find, uh, Here's another character, just I forget what his name is, if he's named a Maori and where he, he doesn't is. have a name, he's just the Maori. Um, but you're right, he's a very admirable character. He is and, a great and then, friend. And that, right. She make, makes a friend of him. And yeah. uh, in the in New Zealand, you see Trollope take a very positive attitude. Their society to him would be more understandable than Aborigines. He can see an organization, he can see militarism, he can understand the Maoris in the way that he probably could not understand. The Aborigine, I presume. I presume that's one of the um, one of the things that, uh, and people might know he goes swimming with them, which is a delightful scene, a bohemian scene of him swimming with them. Yeah, I mean, he he spends more time, although he he's not in New Zealand for very long, um, and um, he moves very quickly through the country, so he doesn't have that in depth experience that he does in Australia. But he actually, even though it's a short trip, he spends much more time interacting with Maori than he does with Indigenous Australians when he's in Australia. Um, and so he gains much more of an understanding. Um, he also, he, it's a stereotype, but he conceived of the, of the Maori as, as a warrior race. And so he admired them for that reason. Um, and I think he, um, he kind of felt when he wrote about Indigenous Australians, he often wrote about them as, as dying out, sometimes in, in almost genocidal terms, sometimes in terms of natural attrition, um, which was a common trope used. Um, I think Patrick Brantling, of course, at the proleptic elegy, where you predict the, um, the dying out or extinction of, of a race um, as a way of kind of making it happen, which is appalling. Um, but Trollope subscribed to that idea quite 
frequently in his writing. Um, and so his, his racial po politics are problematic, um, but he's also constantly re revising himself and he's susceptible to the opinions of the people he's traveling with. So he'll meet somebody and take on board their opinion and then he'll meet somebody else and revise his opinion according to what they think. So he's like a giant sponge in that way. And that makes it very, very difficult and sometimes very painful to read some of the things that he has to say about race. Mm -hmm. um, on the subject of race slash national identity, you mentioned at the beginning of your comment that um, that exchange between Harry and Medlicott, and I think that's the point where um, Harry has gone to Medlicott and said, I want this man watched as though, you know, he can go out into the bush and just survey things. <laughs> and it's such a strange moment um, and such such a paranoid moment. Um, but what's interesting is Medlicott's response, because he says that's a very un-English thing to do. So Medlicott, who until this point has been a character whose, whose gentlemanliness has been in question, not by us, but by some of the other characters in the novella, Medlicott is suddenly making pronouncements about what, what Englishness is. And I find that so interesting. Um, and I think it ties back, I can't remember whose comment it was now, but quite some time ago, somebody made a comment about national identity and nation building. And I think um, all of these things are entangled. Um, and perhaps, you know, what we're learning is that some English values should be transposed, um, the values of, of decency and giving people a, a, a chance, um, but others certainly should not. Yeah, inventing a new country. Yes, yeah, I mean, um, that, that's, that's, that's Patrick certainly... White, from Patrick White, I think he said, said titled something, but, but inventing a new country. And that's a fraught process. Um, and, you know, it's a fraught process for lots of reasons. It's a fraught process because of the climate, but it's a fraught process because it was already a country. It didn't need to be invented. Um, <laughs> people living in Australia quite happily. Um, Joan, you have said there are boundaries between all of the characters created by the cultural mores and social structure and ex structure and expectations within the cultures of the countries where they or their heritage originated attitudes of them stem from these cultural differences. Yes, yeah, that's really nice. Um, so you're right, there is a kind of cultural clash being staged in the pages of this novella, where lots of different values are converging in, in you know, one vast space, but also, you know, one small area. Um, and so yes, um, and this is something that that settler society would have had to adjust to. Um, and, and sometimes it didn't adjust, um, for instance, in the treatment of the Chinese, um, who were, were really treated very, very badly um, and um, often excluded from lots of different areas of, of life and commerce. Um, and so, yeah, there's, this, is a no, this is a novella that is sort of exposing some of those problems um, and, and trying to move all of the characters towards some kind of solution. Um, but of course, not all of these characters can be accommodated, and so Noakes, um, I'm not going to say that, I'm going to spoil it. Um, we'll, we'll pick that up next time so I don't give the ending away, um, that's, that's too much. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's definitely engaging with some of those, those concerns. The other character I wanted to think about was Bates, um, who is not a massively important character, but I think he plays a really important role in the novel. Does anyone remember Bates and and who he is and and why he he might be significant? He doesn't have a huge role in the plot, but I think he's important to Harry. Funny. Well, I don't, I kind of remember him, but he was uh, the uh, top hand for uh, Harry on his farm. But I, the thing I remember most of him when he made the comment and was talking, I don't know what he was comparing it to, but he says, I speak from experience. And to me, he was, that's what he was. He was someone who had uh, been through this stuff and um, kind of, what ordinarily someone like Harry would need, someone to sell him down and give him a perspective of things, but it was a little wider than himself, but uh, but he had, he spoke from experience, which I thought was 
he didn't have all these ideas of how it was to run a sugar, sugar mill or how it was to run a a, a um, farm or a sheep thing. He had done it, and I think he failed. He'd done it and failed. I may be wrong on that. No, you're right. You're absolutely spot on. And I think that's one of the important things. So yes, he has this wealth of experience um, and, and an understanding of the climate and an understanding of bush culture, but he's also failed. So his daily presence on that sheep station, I think is a reminder, you know, he's a living, walking, talking reminder to Harry of what could happen to him. And so mm. it's almost like a kind of haunting um, that, that Harry really fears it. Um, he's incredibly anxious that he might meet the same fate. Um, and again, it's a reminder to the reader of the precarious nature of, of colonial life. Um, and you know, this is something that we saw Dickens comment on in Martin Chuzzlewit um, decades before, where he, he, he warns um, would-be migrants of, of moving to a new place without the kind of skills that that new place needs. Um, and I think there's a different kind of warning embedded in Harry Heathcote about, you know, becoming a farmer in these completely um, different, unfathomable conditions. Um, poor old Fred Trollope eventually failed because the price of wool fell. But the other things that the other thing that um, settlers were still figuring out were things like what we would today call the the El Nino effect um, and the sudden change in the weather you know all of that was still something they were coming to terms with and so um, you know that has a massive effect on on whether your farm is kind of green or underwater or whether it's parched and dry um, and so there is this sense in which um, you know Bates has knowledge of the land but even that knowledge is going to be limited. It's not going to be the kind of knowledge that um, you know the people who had lived in Australia for tens of thousands of years before would bring to it. We talked a little bit um, about um, snobbery and class. Um, I'm wondering if we could come back to it a little bit. Snobbery is my word. I know Ellen didn't like that word and I completely accept that I'm going to keep using it, um, but I'm happy to be taken to, to task for, no, for my, no, um, no. my usage. Um, but I, I wonder if we can think a little bit more about the way class plays out in the bush. We haven't said very much about the female characters yet, um, and, and we should um, because you know class and gender in the bush are, are a very significant thing. Um, but the other thing I'm really interested in is um, this question around gentlemanliness. And I suppose because I'm a Dickensian, I have to be interested in that. Um, but yeah, what does it mean to be a gentleman in the bush? Um, how do we define gentlemanliness in this context? Is it even a relevant category? Really? Um, maybe, so one thing that, that just kind of interested me in that moment when you said that is, um, is it's not that in, in more urban novels, um, gentlemanliness is kind of always defined in relation to forms of femininity or into treatment of women or inter interactions with women. You know, much of it is, is particularly about um, kind of homosocial relationships and, and the ways in which men interact with each other, but um, but there are so few women in this novel and so few women in the bush and and um, and I I was struck in one moment I can't remember it was early it was maybe chapter chapter four when um, when Mendelcott or when the when um, uh, Heathcote's wife and Kate go to um, to visit Mendelcott and and there's a moment when you know we're in his point of view and he says you know. He's sort of saying, well, you know, when you, you, you know, you don't see a lady that often you, you come to attention and, and, you know, he says something like, oh, you know, in choosing the, you know, in choosing one of the sisters, he thought that Heathcote had not perhaps chosen the, the best one. And, right. and, so, and so, you know, we, we, you know, on the one hand, we have, we have Mendelcott who is sort of like talking to us about, um, you know, about, you know, what is English and what isn't English and, and sort of, you know, being the one who's who's presenting rational arguments that he is unpleased with because they're rational and and these sort of you know versions of of English gentlemanliness being presented in those certain ways but also he's you know like there's a kind of 
you know, voracious or almost avaricious relationship to those two women in that moment and the, the kind of judgment of, you know, who's the better woman and who's the less good woman. And, um, you know, and, and so it made me think that maybe, you know, it, it, one of the, the interesting or complicated things in this novel is that is that there's no real, or not no real way, but, but, um, but that gentlemanliness isn't going to be kind of definitionally related to, to any kind of interactions with women, or there's going to be a kind of problematic, that's going to be a problem somehow. Like if gentleman, gentlemanliness is tied to, um, tied to the treatment of women or the viewing of women or the, you know, gallant, you know, gallant relationship to women, like that, that that's just like not how gentlemanliness works or, or that it, I mean, and I, I haven't read the second half of the novel, so you know, I don't know. I don't know how these things resolve themselves, but, um, but that that in some ways, like women, just simply aren't going to be part of the equation in the same way that they are in in other more, you know, in other in well, in nineteenth century novels that are set in other parts of England or parts of England or parts of the UK in general. That's interesting. Um... <laughs> When you were talking about sort of, sort of voracious attitude towards the two women, um, you know, I'm sort of taken back to your discussion of Dracula and Lucy Westenra. Um, but yes, absolutely. Um, it's it's so interesting in that moment. That's such a peculiar scene. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways, it's the only way it can play out, because if it were to play out in a different way, it would be a very different kind of story. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is interesting, and you're right that there are very few opportunities to, to display gallantry in the bush, um, and to, to perform that kind of gentlemanliness and the kinds of, of things that need to happen in order to be able to deport oneself as a gentleman. Um, and so in that context, gentlemanliness has to kind of mutate in some way, it has to become something else. Um, and so that's why I'm so interested in what the sisters have to say about Medlicott, because it's clear that, you know, Kate is interested in, in him. He's the first eligible man to show up <laughs> in a very long time. Um, you know, there's only going to be one conclusion here. Um, and so, you know, Kate has to kind of, she has to either make some compromises, um, she's either going to settle or she's going to redraw what she means by a gentleman. Um, and I think, you know, in the very few interactions we see with those women, we see them kind of skirting around um, what they see as shortcomings or, or deficiencies in Medlicott's gentlemanly status. Um, and, and so um, it's, it, the gentleman is always used as a kind of yardstick to, to measure um, his suitability. But he's often in that first half of the novella, he's often falling short. You know, he is he is like a gentleman. I think I said this before, he's educated as a gentleman. But that means that he's not a gentleman. So, you know, how is this all going to come together? And of course, one way it's going to come together is through a redrawing of his, a reconfiguration of his his relationship with Harry. Um, and um, and Harry's approach to him and Harry's definition of him. And um, we'll see that play out in the next six chapters um, as, as Harry kind of revisits that idea of gentlemanliness and, and thinks a little bit more about it um, in relation to Medlicott. Um, and perhaps, you know, just as at the end of, of Great Expectations, we have a different definition of the gentleman. Um, Harry is, is recrafting his understanding of that term too. At the same time, I think not really letting himself off the hook um, in terms of the way that he is going to conduct himself in the world. Ellen. I was gonna mention that, well, um, Joan says there that not included in things that happen. It's a very conventional portrait of women here. I mean, one is the wife and the other is, and they don't have much room. I don't know how many people have read John Caldigat, there are scenes that we don't get to see in John Caldicott. That was very frustrating. And John Caldicott, I would say, does not conduct himself as a gentleman because he gets very involved with this woman. And whether he married her or not in the Bush ceremony, we never know. They were living together. Um, and he, 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 he doesn't conduct himself as a conventional gentleman at all. And that's one of the reasons he succeeds. And in that one, there's this great fear. And a couple of the characters happens to that you'll decline. And what the, the phrase would be go native. And that you become and, and that you lose your gentlemanliness and you lose your status and you become a drunk all the time. And that's a great fear in these in, in uh, that's it's not in this book, but in, in the John Caldigan, he really does deal with that. 
and he, he, he shies off because he doesn't show us the scenes. We don't, it's all off stage, and then we have to guess what happened. But then we do have a real woman. Remind me her name. I can't remember her name. Euphemia, Euphemia Smith. Euphemia Smith, yes. And she is uh, obviously, a, uh, she's a very interesting character. Um, whether she, how many lovers she's had, and and she works with him, and the two of them become partners, and and uh, she, um, and in that case, we do have a woman who leaves very much the conventional road in order to try to survive. She doesn't do well by the end of the novel. I'm sorry to say, because I'm I root for her, <laughs> but uh, uh, there you do have. Uh, but in order to do it, you have to break a number of taboos and codes in order to show a woman in an interesting way. And, and those stories I've read, when they're more middle class, the women always are conventional. It's only when they're living out in the, in the bush and more desperate that you see them come forward and be more uh, and be more and defend themselves, uh, and uh, because then they're called upon to behave differently. Yes, um, I think Euphemia Smith is is what my grandmother would call uh, would have called an adventuress. Um, yes, she's right, she's right. an extraordinary woman. Um, but I think the difference, the key distinction between, a key distinction between John Caldergate and Harry Heathcote is that Harry Heathcote is about settling. It's about committing to the place and staying in the place. Whereas John Caldergate is about sort of zooming into the colonies, making a swift fortune and yeah. then using it to prop up a, a, a failing estate back in the mother country. And, and I think that's probably, um, for the purposes of this conversation, it's the key discussion. So there is that sense in which um, Caldergate can do whatever he likes in the colonies, he thinks, because <laughs> he's going to leave it all behind. And of course, that later comes to bite him because, you know, the world is shrinking. Um, I think it's Nicholas Burns um, who says that this is Trollope's post Suez novel. Um, and what he means by that is that with the opening of the Suez Canal um, and the rise of steam shipping, the world gets smaller. And so um, that capacity to behave badly in the colonies that has become such a staple of the 19th century plot is then challenged by mobility and, and the character's ability to move back and forth between Australia and, and England. Um, I'm very conscious that we are about to run out of time. Um, we have about four minutes left. Um, and so just thinking towards the next session, um, could you please tell me if there's anything that you would like to pursue in the next session that we haven't talked about here? Certainly in my mind, I'd like to come back to gender issues. Um, and I also want to talk about Harry Hickett as a Christmas book. Um, which I think we'll be able to do once everyone's finished reading it, um, because I think there's much more to say about the Christmas genre and the way that Trollope is playing with it. But I'd really love to know about other things that you um, collectively would like to, to follow up on, things that you'd like to discuss in the next session. So please, anything at all, um, I'll make a note of it and um, we, can, we can bring it up next time. I have my pen poised. Yes, Wayne. Am I unmuted? You are unmuted. Okay, I'd like to uh, talk about Trollope's mother. Okay, and yes, we can do that. The possibility that poor Trollope suffered the anxiety of influence <laughs> towards his mother. <laughs> or maybe we can didn't. definitely do that. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Anyone else, anything at all that you'd like to bring up? Um, we can certainly talk about Trollope's mother. Um, yes, Susan. Um, one, one thought, and um, it's a little while since I read this, because I read it just after your first talk, but is there something in the second half particularly about legality and morality and... Um, what's what's legally right and what's morally right which is something that i found quite interesting in the context of orley farm and i think crops up a bit in the second half here which might be interesting to explore that's great thank you that would be a really good topic to discuss thank you um and we can certainly think about the the legality and the morality of some of the things that that harry does um because 
without giving too much away, Harry becomes um, the person in in some ways he becomes the person he fears. He, he performs the act that he has feared throughout. So yes, that's an excellent suggestion. Anything else? John, yes. I, th I think there's more to be said about fire. In, in Good. The um, and one of, one of the things that is interesting about the fire scenes in this novel is that fire is used to fight fire. Yes. Um, and so if we were to posit as a binary and, and a boundary in this novel, nature versus culture, uh, does fire belong only to one or only to the other? How does fire stand in relation to boundaries. That's great. Thank you, John. We will pick that up. Um, thank you. That would be great. And I'm very happy to spend lots more time talking about fire. Thank you. Renee. Um, we've certainly talked about it today, but I, I'm, I think I'm eager to talk about it more. And that um, that is just precarity and all of the different ways that that precarity is operating in this text, both in, ter you know, in terms of nature, in terms of individuals, in terms of you know, colonialism and the colonial project in terms of the relationship between, you know, between humans and the landscape, just in, in all of these different ways and to think about what sort of, like, in what sort of interventions the novel offers to, to cope with precarity. Great, thank you. That's really good. Um, and I think that's, that's probably where we might pick up. We might pick up with precarity and I think that will lead us very nicely into the rest of the conversation. Sue, I can see that you've asked me to list the topics that have been suggested. So what I think we have, and please someone interject if I've missed one, are uh, Trollope's mother and um, his relationship with her and the anxiety of influence, uh, legal rights versus moral rights, um, more about fire and the boundaries between nature and culture, um, and the way that fire challenges boundaries, and then Renee, Renee's point about precarity. Um, so I think that will give us some, some interesting things to think about as we, we read through the next six chapters of the novel, um, and as we move into our next discussion. Um, thank you all so much. This has been really good for me. I've learned a lot from all of you, and it's been so nice to talk to you about this book. So thank you very much indeed, and I hope to see many of you in a month. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Grace and everyone for another brilliant discussion. Thank you so much. That was a fantastic conversation. Oh, thank you, Renee. That's very sweet. Thank you. <laughs>